Uh, if you're visiting today, a few things for you. We hope that you will stick around and meet what I consider to be the greatest people anywhere on the face of the earth. And also, if you have any questions about anything, nothing you ask will offend us. Please, you can stay and ask whatever you'd like to ask, and we'll talk to you about anything that you'd like to know about. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus asked his apostles a question that is the same question that must be answered by each and every man that walks the face of the earth. A question that will determine what your life is and what it is about, who you are as a man or who you are as a woman, and a question that will determine where you spend every day of your eternity. And it's the question that we find ourselves again face to face with today. The question of who do you, dear man or dear woman or dear child, say that Jesus is? This is the question that this day demands be answered. You see, Christianity is different than every other religion in all sorts of ways. But one of the main ways Christianity is different is that Christianity is based on an event that either did or did not happen 2,000 years ago. That if this event occurred, this one singular historical event, then everything else that Christianity teaches is true, whether you like it or not. But if it didn't occur, if Christ didn't in fact walk out of that grave 2,000 years ago, then nothing that we say is actually true. Then you can write off the Bible in totem, and all of us indeed are just wasting our time. Christianity is indeed a religion of faith, but it's important that you realize that Christianity is not a religion of what's been called blind faith, where God just says, well, just believe it. I hope that you will just have faith. Actually, from the very beginning, God has been the sort of God that says, I know sometimes it's difficult to believe, so here's some good reasons that you should believe. And Christianity, unlike every other religion, is actually testable. You can actually test it to see whether or not it is true. That's exciting. At least it is for me. When John the Baptist was in prison and was about to be killed, he, even John the Baptist, the one who baptized Christ, who said, Here comes the risen Lord before he was even risen. Here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That John the Baptist had doubts about whether or not Christ really was the Messiah. And so John the Baptist, in his moments of suffering, as we often have doubts in our moments of suffering, sends a messenger to Jesus and asks, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we wait for another? Are you really the Messiah? Are you actually the Christ? Are you actually the Savior? And in this moment of John's doubts, not being sure of his belief, Jesus doesn't respond and chastise him for his lack of belief, for his doubts. He instead points to the evidence and says, Go back and tell John this. Tell him the dead are raised. Tell him the sick are healed. Tell him that the blind see. Tell him here are the reasons that he should believe that I am indeed who I am claiming to be. Christianity has never been a, well, just close your eyes and hope that it's true. It's a, here's some good reasons you should believe it's true. Acts 2, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him. That God has shown him to be the Son of God by his mighty works and miracles. John 14, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, Jesus says, or else, if you don't believe me just for my words, believe on account of the works themselves. Or, Mark 16, they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message. Far too often we have seen sort of reason and thinking and intellectual activity as the opposite of faith when it's never that way biblically. That biblically God says, here's some good reasons you should believe what I'm telling you is the truth. Now, let's set, set the stakes for this question pretty clearly. Paul does it well for us in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says this. If Christ has not been raised, if all we're doing today is celebrating some fake memory. If all we're doing today is getting together on the day that something has to do with a bunny, something to do with eggs, and celebrating because we go to church and that's what we're supposed to do on Easter. If Christ has not actually, physically, literally, in history been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Further, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Further, if Christ has not been raised, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. 
never to return again. If Christ, we have hope in this life only. That is, if he did not rise, we are of all people most to be pitied. Listen, let's be clear. If Christ didn't rise from the grave, then all of this is foolishness. Religion makes a very poor hobby. But if he rose... Nothing else can ever be the same. If he rose, then that one event is the central event of the entirety of the history of the universe. If it's true, then nothing can ever be the same. Everything in the world hinges on what we celebrate this day. I want to make one statement to you this morning, but I'm going to make it in parts. Part one, Christ rose. Now, there is a thick, weighty, evidential argument to be made purely historically that Christ did in fact rise from the dead. In fact, whenever I have doubts, because I do have doubts, I'm, I'm analytical and skeptical by nature and, and, and very often to a fault. And when I have doubts, one of the first things that comes to my mind that brings me back to Christ, that the Spirit uses to bring me back to Christ, is what in the world would I do with the evidence for the resurrection of Christ? How would I explain all the things I know to be true just historically if Christianity isn't true when it comes to the resurrection? Let me give an extremely brief display of why the resurrection is the best explanation of Christianity and what we have of the evidence in sort of a chronological way. And each statement I make here is not a statement you need the Bible for or you need to be a Christian for. So if you're here today and you don't believe the Bible, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, and you just want to believe things that can be proven historically, I have some statements here for you. First is this. Here's what we know historically. Jesus died and was buried. Now, you'll probably see on Facebook on Easter weekend, somebody will say something like, well, Jesus never really existed. But that person would be laughed out of any scholarly hall today. No one believes that anymore. That's called Jesus mysticism movement, and that's been dead for over a century. Again, you'll see it on Easter weekend or Christmas weekend on Facebook because we don't know any better. But nobody believes he didn't exist anymore. In fact, we have more evidence, not just for Christ's life, but also his death on the cross, than we have for any other event in ancient history. And it's not particularly close. If you think about how rare it would be to have some document that pointed to an event in the first century. If you're a historian and you wanted to show that an earthquake happened in AD 63 and you had one document that said it happened, then it's pretty likely it happened. But if you had two documents independent of each other that said that our earthquake happened, then it's treated as virtually fact that an earthquake happened in AD 63. We have more than 10 documents, Christian and non-Christian, that talk about Christ's life and his death on a Roman cross because of the instigation of the Jews. There is no more well-attested event in all of history than the fact that Christ died on a cross. We know that with almost absolute certainty. So that if you were to doubt that, we, uh, that Christ really lives, or if you were to doubt that Christ died on the cross, you would have to also say that we can know nothing about history. And we need to get rid of all those classes that were taken in school that teach us about things from documents that are older than the ones that talk about Christ's death and burial. We know historically, not biblically even, that Christ died and that he was buried. We also know, secondly, that the tomb was found empty. Again, historical facts not debated among scholars. The scholarly consensus that Christ died and was buried. His tomb was then found empty. There's a lot of reasons we know this. Let me give you a couple. Number one, we know that for the first 150 years after Christ's death on the cross, the only argument for what happened to Christ was that the apostles stole the body. That's what people were saying. The apostles stole the body. You can see that in the Bible. When the people go to the Pharisees and they say, hey, the tomb's empty. And the Pharisees say, well, tell them the apostles stole the body. Now, of course, if the tomb wasn't empty, they could just say, there's the body. Christianity dies on the spot. But they couldn't do that. They had to come up with some answer for why the tomb was indeed empty. And the second reason we know it's true is because just a few days after the alleged resurrection, the disciples were going around preaching in the very city where the tomb was that Christ had risen from the dead. And all the people who hated Christianity, whether Jewish or Roman, if they wanted to kill it, just had to walk over to the tomb and show that his body was still there. But they couldn't because it was gone. Okay, so here's what we know historically. Jesus died on a Roman cross and was buried in the tomb. We also know that a few days later that tomb was empty. You don't got to be a Christian for either one of those facts. We know those to be true. Thirdly, we know the apostles really did believe that he rose from the dead. Doesn't mean he did, but they really did believe that he did. 
How do we know that? We know that they were claiming this from the very beginning. We have documents that go back to within five years of the cross where the disciples are already saying that Christ rose from the grave. They were saying that immediately. So you can't say it was legend that developed over time. They were preaching these things from the very beginning. And their claims to resurrection, their claims to seeing Jesus, it wasn't like they said, well, you know, we saw Jesus at the grocery store in Nile, and then we looked again, and he wasn't there anymore. They were saying that he stayed with them for like days, and ate fish, and drank wine, and they touched him, and they were with him for a long period of time. These apostles were claiming this thing. And also, more crucially, the apostles, all of them, were willing to, willing to suffer terrible suffering along with martyrdom. Because they were so convinced it was true. Now, the fact that they were willing to suffer doesn't mean that it was true, but it means that, that they thought it was true. Because liars make very poor martyrs. Tradition says 11 of the 12 were killed for their faith. We can't really prove that historically. But we, we do know that six of them were almost definitely killed because they were preaching the resurrection. Now, again, it doesn't prove that Christ rose, but it proves that they were absolutely convinced that he rose. I don't know if you know what Babylon B is. If you don't, you should look it up when you get done with this. Babylon B is a Christian satirical website that uh, makes jokes and stuff. A lot of it at our expense, but they're Christians and it's great. They had a sketch that posted this past week where the disciples were all huddled together. And Peter says, okay, here's the plan. We're going to steal the body of Jesus. And we're going to hide it better than anyone's ever hid anything ever. And we're going to tell everybody that he rose from the grave. And the apostles are like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. What's in it for us? And he said, well, get this. Here's what's going to happen. After we do that, they're going to murder us. Right? <laughs> and one of, the, one of the apostles, John, says, I, I guess I'm confused. I don't really, I don't really understand. That they're, going to, they're going to kill us? And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to, they're going to, that's the brilliant of it. They're going to kill us. And he says, okay, but before that, we'll get wealthy. Maybe we'll get women. Or we'll get comfort. You know, we'll, maybe we'll get esteem. We'll get famous. He says, no, no, no. This is the brilliance. Before that... All that's going to happen is we're going to be ostracized out of our communities. The Jewish people are going to hate us. We're going to be ripped apart from our families. We're going to be beaten regularly. We're going to be imprisoned. And then they're going to murder us. And no one's going to know our name for at least 100 years, at least with any fame and acclaim. The apostles' belief doesn't mean that Christ rose from the dead, but they were convinced that he did. So much so that they were willing to give up everything in their lives, including their families, including their freedom, including their comforts. And even to their torturous deaths, because they were convinced that he was risen from the dead. They believed. Again, not a very controversial historical statement. Famously, Chuck Colson, who was a political aide to Richard Nixon, who was involved in the Watergate scandal, he said this of the apostles' belief. He said, I know the resurrection's a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks, and their only threat was imprisonment. You're telling me 12 apostles did it for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And then fourthly, we know because of Paul. Because this man, Paul, who hated Jesus, who had everything in the world going for him, who was one of the leading men in the most powerful religion in the world, outside of Rome itself, who was on his way to wealth and comfort and everything that he wanted, for some reason, according to him, because he saw the risen Jesus, gave everything up to live a life of homelessness and tent building and imprisonment and eventually being killed. And it's very hard to make sense of why Paul did that. If you didn't actually see the risen Jesus. Now, if you're not a Christian today, what do you do with that? What do you do with these things? Again, none of these things are just biblical truths. These are historical truths that we have to have some sort of answer for. You can't say the apostles stole the body. They believed so much they went to their torturous deaths. You can't say it was legend that developed over time. We know they were preaching this from the very beginning. You can't say they just hallucinated because a group of people don't hallucinate all the same things at once. There is really no good answer. It's just impossible. But of course, we Christians know the only real impossibility was for him not to rise. The real impossibility was for the grave somehow to hold that man. And the truth is that he really did rise. That is, that changes everything. Dear Christian, <laughs> it's real, it actually occurred. 
What you're doing here today is not just following in your parents' footsteps and believing whatever they believed and doing what, what you're doing here today is celebrating the one historical event that more than anything else changes everything. Secondly, Christ rose victorious. This moment that actually occurred in history is the moment that everything in the Bible has been leading to and that everything afterward points back to. This has been the victory the people of God have been waiting for and that God has been foreshadowing since Genesis chapter 3 and since sin into the world. This is Adam facing a test in a new garden and instead of failing at this time and earning death, passing the test and earning life for the world. This is Isaac who was actually sacrificed on the altar and wasn't just kept alive, but made alive again. This is Joseph being exalted to the right hand of the most powerful one so that he can intercede for his people and save his brothers and sisters. This is Jonah being cast headlong into the valley of the shadow of death so that three days later he may rise and bring the gospel, bring the good news to a sinful people so that they may have salvation. This is the Passover lamb being sacrificed for the sake of his people and whose sacrifice was proved sufficient. Maybe most clearly, this is David standing out in front of the people of God, up against the enemy the people of God were terrified of. The Goliath, the people of God knew they could never fight on their own, that they definitely would lose to. They had been mocking them day after day after day, and against which they had no hope. And David himself, alone, by himself, fights the giant. David himself, alone, by himself, wins the victory, cuts the head of the giant, and all the Israelites get to charge as if it was their victory. That is what's occurring here when Christ rises from the tomb, is the giant of sin and death has been defeated, so that we, the people of God, who stood back in fear and just hoped that Jesus would do it, get to charge as if we were the ones who were victorious, that now his victory, our champion, actually indeed counts for us. Christ rose victorious over every sin so that the Christian has no reason anymore to feel overcome by your mistakes, to feel overcome by your sins, to feel overcome by all the ways that you have indeed fallen short. Christ has defeated them once and for all. When he said it was finished, he wasn't exaggerating. Every one of your sins and your shortcomings died with him on the cross. Past sins and future sins has cleansed us from all sin so that he may present you now, dear Christian, right now, even in this moment, as you are still a sinner, as justified and as clean and as beautiful and as righteous. That is the story of the resurrection. Hebrews chapter 10. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time all those who are being Sanctified. Listen, no longer, dear Christian, must you stand on trial against your sin, knowing the whole time that you are guilty, knowing that you're just waiting for the gavel to rightly come down and declare it as such, waiting for just the moment that God damns you to hell as you deserve. Instead, you have found victory in Christ, the one who stands at the right hand of the judge and says, this one is mine. Now, let me be clear. We Christians don't believe what many people accuse us of believing. They say we believe that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. They give us far too much credit. We don't believe anyone is good. We believe that all are bad, that all are guilty, that all have fallen short, that everyone, every individual, stands before their just and holy creator as one guilty and, right, guilty and rightly condemned. We believe that everyone desires to justify themselves but doesn't have the ability to do so. We don't believe the Christian is good and the non-Christian is bad. We don't believe that the Christian doesn't sin and the non-Christian does. We believe that all sin, that all have fallen short of the glory of God. The difference in the Christian and the non-Christian it's not that one sins and one doesn't sin. The Christian is that one, the difference is that one of them submits to God in his sin and is thus washed clean and one does not submit to God and is thus never washed 
Christianity is not that sinners go to hell and good people go to heaven. It's that sinners who don't submit to God are allowed their choice of hell and sinners who do submit to God are washed clean and invited into heaven by the pure grace of God. This is not a story, this all story of the universe of the good people versus the bad people. This is a story of those who bow to Christ and those who don't. We find ourselves, all of us, in desperate need of the grace of Christ. It is not that some win at life and some lose. It's that only one ever won. It's that there is only one who is ever victorious. And that his victory can count for you. If you will bow and reside in him. He knew we'd never win the victory. So he won it for us. Christ rose victorious. Christ rose victorious for the church. Last two are shorter. Christ rose victorious for the church. Here's what I mean by that. Christ didn't rise victorious just for you. One of the one of the one of the shortcomings of modern Christianity is that modern Christianity in large part has become very individualized. Where it's just about you following Jesus on your own. Your individual relationship with Jesus. And when you come to worship, it's just about you and your time with God. When that whole idea is is unconscionable to the history of the church, that the church is who Christ died for. Yes, it's true that he died for you, but he died for us. He died for his bride as a whole. He didn't die just for you individually. He died for us. That Christianity is unavoidably communal. That there is no example in all of Scripture of someone being converted and then saying, I'm just going to go follow Jesus on my own. That as soon as someone is converted, they are immediately incorporated into the people of God, or the word we call it, the church. They are immediately brought together with the church. Christ died not for me, but for us. That just like when you're adopted into a new family, you find yourself that evening at a dinner table with new siblings. When you're adopted into Christ, you find yourself at the dinner table every week with new siblings. And, and they're not all going to be easy to get along with. And some of them, some of them are going to be sinners and they're going to be difficult and frustrating. And of course, I mean by some of them, all of them. And yet they are still the ones for whom Christ died. Ephesians chapter 5, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. So he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Listen, the church isn't perfect yet. He's not done with us yet. We've got a lot of perfecting to go. And like Wayne said last week, if you're looking for the perfect church, you have walked into the wrong place. And if this was the perfect church, it's not anymore now that you're here. This whole story of Christianity is not about perfection. It's about all of us, selfish sinners, learning to be a little bit more like Jesus together. And in fact, you need each other for that. There are many, many commands in the New Testament that you can't obey unless you have difficult people in your life. Welcome home. Here we are. We have given you the opportunity to obey those commands. Christ didn't die just so you individually could live your life with Jesus. That idea is entirely foreign to the New Testament. Christ died so you could be part of this body, for the body of Christ. Whether it's this church or a church elsewhere, it doesn't matter. But to be part of the people of God so that you could Look for ways to help other people grow. And so that other people could hold you accountable and help you grow. One of the great flaws of modern Christianity is thinking that we can do this thing on our own. Far too much pride. We desperately need each other. And we need you. Finally, Christ rose victorious for the church's resurrection. All of you, without exception, have brought with you this morning some sort of pain, some sort of loss, some sort of burden, Easter not quite being what it should be because of those who have left, realizing that things aren't the way that they should be. All of you come here this morning with, with pain. Genesis chapter 3 is the chapter where sin comes in. happened pretty quickly. The very next chapter, chapter 4, is often referred to as the death chapter. Because after sin comes into play, chapter 4 is just so-and-so lived so many years and he died. And he died. 
and then he died. Over and over, the whole chapter is just telling you about all these people who died because of the sin that had just happened. It's never more clear to us that the world is not exactly as it should be as when death is with us. But Christ's resurrection promises you that your suffering, that your burden, and that death is not the end of the story. As C.S. Lewis said so well, Christ's resurrection promises that all the evil in the world will eventually be undone. That every struggle is temporary. And that every gravestone really should just say, for now. In a world of death, in a world of pain, in a world of just problem after problem, Christ alone offers actual, real, meaningful hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, We do not grieve as others who have no hope since. Why? Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, everything about suffering changes. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, everything about death changes. Since he will indeed bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Because he rose, the Christian can say, death, where is your sting? Because he rose, the Christian rests in the reality that the world is not as it should be, but one day it will be, and one day soon, Lord, come quickly. That we long for those who have gone before. We feel that things aren't right, but we rejoice that Christ rose as the foretaste of all those who have gone before, that will follow him in the same resurrection, and that if the Lord tarries, that you and I will follow him in the same resurrection as well. Dear Christian, this is not the end of the story. Whatever it is, this is temporary. And because he rose, he promises that every step of this suffering you're going through, that he will take with you. If you aren't a Christian, Christ's resurrection is not good news at the moment for you. Here's what I mean. Acts 17 says he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Just like there is an actual day 2000, actual day 2,000 years ago in the past where Christ's heart began to beat again, there is a day in your future where you and I and everyone who has gone before and will come after actually and literally will stand in front of God. The one who has created you. There will be a day of judgment. If you aren't a Christian, what are you waiting for? In Matthew chapter 12, the scribes and Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. And he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You want your sign? Here it is. He has risen. He has risen indeed. And you need nothing else to show you that it is true. There are no excuses anymore. You have found yourself here today by the sovereign hand of God. He has brought you here to hear the truth of the story of God, the beginning of it all, the resurrection of Christ, and that because of that your entire life must be bent towards Him, that your entire self must be bowed to Him, and that anything short of that will find you in front of a wrathful God in the end. But that all is required to be made right with God is not to get your life together and start doing it right, but is to bow to the one who has promised to cleanse you, to bow to the one who has offered you His grace. Have you turned your back on Jesus? Have you turned your back on His bride, the church? It is not yet too late. There was an actual moment in time where Christ's dead and cold body lay still in the tomb without anything in Him, and then in just a moment, His heart beat again. And because of that, we can be sure 
that you will rise too. And we will meet the Lord in the air. And us, we, and all those who have gone before, who only temporarily lie in the grave, will forever be with the Lord. If we can pray for you, if we can help you at all, anything at all, please come while we stand and while we sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin was laid Here in the death of Christ I live commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of no scheme of 